This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your conference access code. Follow Recording. Let me once again officially welcome everybody to today's event, Conservation Finance Innovation. This event is sponsored by the Conservation Finance Innovation Network and the Government Innovators Network. And um, without any further ado, I would like to turn things over to today's moderator, Jim Levitt, the director for the Program on Conservation Innovation at the Harvard Forest, Harvard University. Good morning, or uh, uh, good afternoon to the several of you who have joined us from Europe. Uh, this is Jim Levitt. I am very happy to welcome all of you to the inaugural expert chat sponsored by the Conservation Finance Innovation Network. We uh, plan over the next several years to bring you uh, several times a year opportunities to listen to and interact with experts in conservation finance, both from the United States and from the international community. Today we have with us Pat Cody, who is uh, presently the founding director of Cody DeMar Partners, which is an investment banking firm in Washington and New York. Pat uh, continues to be deeply involved in conservation, both in the United States and internationally, uh, as well as Ian Johnson. Uh, Ian is with us uh, today from, I believe he's in London today. He is the former vice president of the World Bank for uh, ESSD, uh, known in shorthand as sustainability. And Ian and Pat will be talking to us about frontiers in conservation finance, uh, both in the United States and internationally. Now before uh, I open it up to Pat, let me very quickly uh, show you a new tool on the web um, that the Conservation Finance Innovation Network is offering, and this should give you some introduction to the network itself. And we're just waiting for that um, website to come up on the, on the screen. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a new website that we just got up in the last uh, several weeks. You can see on the page that's being featured right now, we have a resource in the spotlight, which is the report that Pat Cody will be speaking about today. And below that, uh, a welcome page that tells you a little bit about the Conservation Finance Innovation Network. Uh, I simply want to say right now that we will be bringing you information resources uh, regarding conservation finance or bringing new capital into conservation of several kinds, uh, publications, educational resources, particularly uh, short courses that are being offered and case studies that you might use in curricular settings, advisory resources from public, private, and nonprofit organizations in the field who are expert in conservation finance, conference materials, including reports from conferences and notices of upcoming conferences in this very rapidly growing uh, area of interest, uh, expert chats, such as the one we're doing today, and a feature that I'm going to introduce at the end of today's session, which is ask the experts uh, a way for uh, people in the community of practice to submit a question that we in turn will submit to several experts in the field and then turn back and share with you. Um, the last thing I want to emphasize right now, Jim, if you'll go to the next page of this, uh, to about the network, um, there we go is that uh, the Conservation Finance Innovation Network, while it is uh, sponsored at the, uh, at the Kennedy School of Government and at the Harvard Forest, includes a number of members who are now mostly contributing in kind to uh, our body of knowledge and to the work that it takes to get all of this up. These members include the Ash Institute at the Kennedy School of Government, the Center for Business and Environment at Yale, I believe Je Brad Gentry uh, is with us today, or expects to be. Uh, the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. Story Clark, who does conservation consulting out of uh, her home in Wyoming. The Island Press, the Land Trust Alliance. The Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, I believe that Greg Ingram, who is Lincoln Institute's president, uh, is listening today. The Lime Timber Company. 
the Program on Conservation and Innovation at the Harvard Forest and the Trust for Public Land Center for Conservation Finance, represented today by Ernest Cook. So we've got quite a bit of talent and expertise uh, collecting around uh, this, this site on the web and these broadcasts, and we very much look forward to your participation. Now, with that, I will turn the program over to my friend Pat Cody, who convened in New York this April, March, excuse me, a group of private, uh, public, and nonprofit sector representatives uh, to think about the challenges facing conservation finance in the United States and internationally over the next five to ten years. It was a it was a very challenging, stimulating meeting. Pat published a report from that meeting, which is available to you on the CFIN website on the home page. Uh, and he has uh, several slides, about ten minutes of discussion, to share uh, the findings from that, that report with you. So, Pat, please take it away. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the uh, in cyberspace with Ian Johnson. We used to share. Um, a physical space on 8th Street in, in, D, in Washington, D.C., uh, and we were both at the, at the beginning of the Global Environmental Facility, which was the largest financial effort of its time looking at global conservation needs comprehensively. Uh, my focus this morning is to promote finance innovation for conservation finance. The March workshop from earlier in the year was a modest capstone to, to years of investigation. And it was designed to put together a handful of experts from both the conservation community and the Wall Street community in the same room and put a, uh, a laundry list of, of ideas to discuss. So a lot of ideas and not a lot of time, so it was uh, not meant to, to dig as deep as people probably would have liked into into all that, but it was meant to propel thinking forward and in the end find champions for those those ideas. So, um, and as you know, and thanks to all that effort is to Harvard and Lincoln Institute, Island Press, and Open Space Institute. Um, now for the slideshow. The background of of the remarks workshop was an effort I started when associated with the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust when we had a lot of great projects to save open space and it was very hard to find the financial resources to do it. And particularly, we're in a very urbanized area, so open space is competitively sought uh, most aggressively by the real estate development community. And so unless you have an owner that is particularly uh, dedicated to preserving the land, you have to compete in the marketplace for that open space, both in time and financial resources. And the first step was uh, kind of understanding the existing model or system of finance within conservation finance, which was, uh, you know, was broad ranging, but to a certain extent largely dependent upon some level of government taking permanent ownership. And that process was tedious and, and lengthy and, and not very responsive to market needs. So being an investment banker, my kind of attitude toward this was, and my exploration was to try to see how we could bring private capital into the process that could also compete real time in real amounts to, to save open space. So the goal was to dramatically expand, is to dramatically expand financial resources to, you know, to preserve, um, preserve open space. Report. Uh, I'm just going to focus on uh, what the key takeaways were during the report. The report talks about next. Step. I'm yes. sorry, this is Jim Cooney. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We're getting a little bit of background noise, and I haven't muted the attendee phones yet, which I'm going to do now, and that okay. should solve the problem. This line is now muted. Okay, the key takeaways was that uh, I think everyone, it was like, uh, you know, maybe the analogy is uh, it's, it's like putting a picture of a great meal in front of people but without getting a chance to eat the meal. So I think people were excited about the ideas 
But everyone wanted to roll up their sleeves and get to work. I think a lot of people feel that uh, uh, many of these ideas and themes uh, hold promise, and uh, but they need work, and we really had to figure out a way to kind of drive, as one of the participants said, to drive toward advancement on this. The other thing which came out of was, is, is although um, even on the conservation side, uh, there were some new faces and some new ideas that people were unaware of. So I think the sense of uh, the need to share experience, to know what was going on, to take lessons learned, was exciting to all the participants. And I, you know, Jim's lead off on the on the network is you know a clear response uh, in part to the, to that need. But I think the participants were soft congratulatory in the sense that the discussion I think went well, went quickly, and so people felt and people felt comfortable. So they uh, they thought that this kind of forum could be the basis for uh, further events, maybe of a, of a larger scale, and and that, and that's underway. The the idea to to, to mobilize something, and and that kind of goes back to getting specific. So. Uh, there was a lot of energy coming out of the meeting. You know, the warnings from the people that have struggled in this area for a long period of time. You know, the law, the, the laws of physics for finance are: if you're going to get investments, you've got to have cash flow streams, which means revenue streams, and you got to have balance sheets or guarantees. And you know, an, an area that's um, you know, that's making progress. For example, wetlands mitigation. You know, is bringing forward value for ecological services and creating revenue streams, and therefore creating uh, investments. And we had a private equity firm in, as a participant who had just invested in a wetlands mitigation firm. But there's certainly a lot to be done. I think for the land trust community, or maybe everybody. Cascades from the state of Washington, you know, made a nice presentation on basically it's a, a hundred year look of what's going to happen to their area. And, you know, the, the beauty of that was it was put together in a very craftsmanlike way involving all the stakeholders. But once you kind of can, even though things are obviously going to change the day you publish something like that. It set a framework that then could get all the participants to say, basically, I'll take up that part of the burden, or here's something which we need to work more on, or here's the issues with saving that watershed. Uh, there was good discussion on uh, the use of bonds, and uh, Matt Pearson from Morgan Stanley and Patrick O'Connell from the Evergreen Conservation Finance Firm. Uh, you know, made a very strong case that the community is under underutilizing uh, bond financing, and um, and one of the byproducts of that is they showed up at the Land Trust Alliance rally uh, this fall in Denver and sponsored a specific workshop on that. So um, we had a large participants from the timber financing, and obviously across the country, that's been. <coughs> You know, um, environmentally based timber purchases responding to the huge turnover of lands from the major forest companies uh, who are liquidating their lands, and and conservation organizations have have heavily stepped in, and that financial model, you know, has proved proved to be very successful. But what came up at the seminar, uh, the workshop was the um, as non-forest values like real estate development, second homes um, show up, then the, the economics of this are changing. So the financial needs change. Um, talk about training. Um, the building up of human resources is critical. Uh, we've got to get people with finance backgrounds. And one of the, you know, what we'll talk talk about later. Uh, patient capital, one of my projects that I intend to kind of pursue is that I think there needs to be a, a significant national fund that can that 
that can take risk in buying real estate and hold it for longer than normal periods until it can find maybe a more permanent home. Um, carbon credits, I think the, the workshop kind of punted on this. I think everyone saw a lot of activity of people anticipating the, the trading mechanisms, but I think there was a lot of questions about the relevance to open space. and, and uh, Several foundations were were present and uh, there was discussions about how they could help uh, catalyze the steps the steps forward and kind of finally I think that we in a certain sense defined conservation finance you know as a field that deserved its own you know deserved its own place in the sky so the conclusion was a lot of good ideas a lot of energy but let's pick them out. Let's pick out a few to work on and, and really and, and uh, really see if we can't achieve some milestones with those various ideas. And it's, I mean, it's amazing since March. The if Brad Gentry is on, I mean, Brad, with the help of everybody, including Jim, you know, put together a week-long boot camp in New Haven and the for conservation. Uh, uh, people whose careers are in conservation, and uh, it was really exciting because a lot of them showed up at the Land Trust Alliance rally, and the, the amount of energy and uh, and excitement about kind of opening up that venue was really, really, really exciting. And I mentioned Jim's uh, Conservation Finance Innovation Network. That's going to be an important tool. I think working on the human resources, I think everyone knows, so reaching out to MBA programs or college programs or uh, getting land trust to hire financial officers. Lessons learned, there's energy going into developing case studies. Uh, mitigation credits are becoming financeable beyond wetlands, you have species and, and um, um, and bond issues, I think, are, are starting. So I, 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 I'm, I'm really quite pleased that the work that was done seems to have, in fact, found champions uh, who are running with the ball. So um, uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I want to refer everyone to two documents that Pat prepared that uh, give you some of his thoughts on this in writing. Again, one is on the home page of the CFINetwork.org, which is his report from this Conservation Finance Summit that we held in New York. Uh, the second uh, is the chapter that he wrote on the need for human resources to uh, help stimulate the generation of capital resources in conservation that appears in From Walden to Wall Street, which you can get from the Island Press. Um, Pat really got, uh, he was one of the very first people who said that this was a field that needed, as he said, its own place in the sky, uh, and we really appreciate his continuing to push uh, the ball in that direction. Um, let me also say that uh, I know that there are several short courses on conservation finance, such as the Yale boot camp that happened last year, that are in the planning stages now for next year. Uh, there may be one at Yale, there may be one uh, west of the Mississippi. So keep your eye posted on that, and I know that the people who participated in that week-long course got an enormous amount out of it. Now, before I turn to Ian, let me ask the audience to participate in uh, two brief survey questions. Uh, the first one is coming up, and um, Jim Cooney, if you could instruct the listeners on how to respond to the questions. Sure. The uh, slide that is currently displaying is a uh, survey tool that we have and if you just click on the option that um, is most suitable and you should see the results from the entire audience tabulating. Is that. All right, that's, it's, you can see it tabulating now and we have uh, a nice audience today of 56 people so we'll wait until some 50 votes are in. Um, it looks like most of the people, not surprisingly, are from the nonprofit sector. I see uh, lots of people signed on from the Nature Conservancy, from the Trust for Public Land, 
for, from the Quebec Labrador Atlantic Center for the Environment and so on, from the Land Trust Alliance. Chris Soto is here. So we welcome them. We also know that there are public, private, uh, and academic uh, representatives here. I'm not voting right now, but I would add my name to that academic group. Um, and as Pat made clear in his chapter in From Walden to Wall Street, we need people from all four sectors uh, to participate in this community of practice if it is to uh, advance significantly. All right, let me ask, um, I think we've got, we're going to move to the second question, which is in which region do you work? Uh, I think this will help um, Ian have a little bit better idea of his audience. Uh, my expectation is, and it's proving out, that most people who are voting right now are from the United States and from the East Coast. Uh, we have a fair number of brave people on the West Coast who got up early to participate in this, and several participants from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I know Ian uh, is calling in from Europe, uh, and one of our hopes as we expand this network is that we get uh, increasing participation from the rest of the world. All right, so with that uh, brief snapshot, I know there, there are other people who uh, could vote, but I think that gives you a pretty good idea of where we're coming from. Um, I'm going to turn the program over to Ian Johnson. Ian is the recent re recently retired uh, Vice President for Sustainable Development at the World Bank, the former chair of the CGIAR, or the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, and today is active as an advisor to GLOBE, the Global Legislators Organization for a Balanced Environment. Um, GLOBE's uh, website is listed there on the page that you see, and it's quite interesting. Uh, Angela Merkel uh, is featured on their home page addressing this group, so it's, it's got the attention of uh, heads of state in Europe, uh, in North, and, uh, North America, and um, Latin America that I know of and probably even further. So with that, Ian, uh, I, I know Ian does not have any slides and he's going to uh, speak from uh, his perch in London. Okay, Jim, thanks very much indeed. I'm online now. Um, first, just to say it's wonderful to be visiting even virtually one of my favorite cities and certainly my favorite university. And it's great to be with you, Jim, and to be with Pat Cody. I think uh, Pat uh, uh, um, was really a tremendous influence at the World Bank when I was there, not only in helping set up the Global Environment Facility, but just tremendously influential as the Executive di Director from the United States in prom promoting issues associated with sustainable development and conservation. So it's wonderful to be with good friends again. What I thought I would do is talk about three broad areas very briefly. The first is just to make some comments on uh, uh, while there are a lot of similarities between the work that goes on, the very fine work that goes on in the U.S., uh, there are some differences between some of the work that goes on in the richer world. And in a way, biological diversity and conservation measures are, are really a global issue. They're not uh, limited to any one state or region. Um, much of the great biodiversity we have left in the world is in, in the poorer parts of the world. So I thought I'd say a few words about that. Secondly, make a few general comments on financing, and then finally just talk about some of the sort of financing options, ideas, areas for exploration. Uh, Pat touched on many of them in my view with the, the very fine work he's been doing. So let me just kick it off by talking about some of the differences that we would observe in emerging economies rather than part of the richer world. I think the first is that property rights uh, are often not as well established in many countries. Communal rights exist also in some areas of indigenous peoples, and that can add a complexity or a challenge to how to manage conservation. It also provides a tremendous opportunity as well. Secondly, I would say that very often the sort of rule of law, the regulatory frameworks that are needed may be weak and very easily violated with sanctions and enforcement measures weak. If I compare some of the work I do know in the States where you look at how to get easements into, uh, into uh, land, um, land management and landscape management, very often the battles that have gone on and the effort uh, that has been put in has basically been to get the easements uh, under protection. And once that is done, you have a pretty good sense that they will stay that way. 
I think it's very different in many, many poorer countries because very often other factors uh, than rule of law uh, put pressure on land and, and the easements uh, that are so easy to protect in, in say, North America, and I, I've seen some of the work of some of the, of the North American NGOs, may be less easy and less easily transferable to, um, to any developing countries. And the third, and this actually was interesting listening to, to Pat, is as I've made a note saying, I think you often have to look more carefully at what I would call either the forcing factors or underlying causes of habitat destruction. And as, um, uh, as um, Pat noted with real estate developers in the Washington area where the pressure to convert land is very great, in the developing world, it's often agricultural extensification, and this may well be an, incre an increasing issue uh, if we move towards biofuels, by the way, uh, where you've got competition for food and biofuels might promote and push agricultural extensification, which will come at the expense of very often of areas that may be under conservation or should be. Poverty, obviously, population growth, use of traditional biomass for energy, etc. So one of the key differences, I think, is to really have to really understand those forcing factors. What drives change in developing countries? What are the underlying causes, and how do you analyzing, analyze them? But as I said, we should never forget that the bulk of biological diversity, and therefore in many of the areas that are under threat in the world today are in the developing world, and conservation and its finance associated with it is one of the most important issues, I think, and one of the issues that's slightly going off the agenda, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, uh, on the development and sustainable development agenda. Let me just turn very briefly to some general comments. First, I think it's useful to think of financing both for development of capital costs, or first cost, uh, um, and recurrent costs. And often in many countries that I've worked on, it is the, the problem of the supply of local currency recurrent costs, not only mobilizing money for capital investment or land purchase or whatever it may be, but the, the monthly payment of, um, of park wardens, the monthly payment of those who uh, uh, need to help in the protection and management of, of conservation areas. Local currency recurrent costs can be a very big issue. The second one I would say, and I think we're probably touching on this also in Pat's talk, it's very useful to get away from what is often seen as the dichotomy of people or parks, people or conservation areas, to people and parks. And I think this is very important as an issue because it means placing at least as much emphasis on how people living in and adjacent to conservation areas can benefit as it is to consider protecting the ecosystem and seeing how that will benefit. So I think the issues of, of employment for people, people feeling that part of the solution, not outside, not, not part of the problem, is very important. And I think this also links in with the need to see it as landscape management writ large, where both people and wildlife and the kinds of protection that you want in ecological services are all brought together. It means bringing in local communities, local governments, and central governments. The third point I would make more generally, and I think this is probably true throughout the world, is there is a public, there is a very much a public good nature of conservation. It is inherently a public good quality, partly global, uh, and partly national and local. And what that means, I think, is that you have to have enlightened public policy, and it must play a role in uh, encouraging the private sector and markets to do what they can do best. So we have, I think, we've got to move towards new models of private and blended, blended finance of public and private, where the private sector does what it is good at, and the public sector provides a supportive framework role. It encourages the kind of patient capital that is needed. It encourages sometimes first costs, uh, first past the post costs. And I think that that's an important dimension of public enlightened public policy, whether it's at the international level or the local level. The first point I would make, and maybe this is a little, a little controversial, is that the conservation community seem to have lost a bit of ground in the groundswell of interest in climate change. I would say that's certainly true in Europe from my observations. 
and especially in the growth of the carbon markets that we've seen over the past few years, which are spending at about $30 billion at their dollars at the moment with the European trading scheme and what is called the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism. And I think that that has, that has put, put back a little bit the, um, the agenda. In a sense, I've always felt that the Climate Change Treaty always saw itself as the star pupil and the Biodiversity Treaty as somewhat lower order. And I think there is a real need for the community and the private sector and others to come to increasingly align conservation efforts with climate change. And there are opportunities, and in my judgment going forward, there will be huge opportunities. There is a, a funny acronym which some of you will have heard of called LULUCF, Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry. And what that says is that forests play a very important role in, um, in uh, addressing climate change, both in mitigation through sequestration, but also through adaptation, for example, protecting watersheds, uh, managing water, uh, etc. And I think what we need to do is to see where are there opportunities for a private sector to make money out of the CDM through the forestry sector. At this point, it's, it's very, very poorly represented in the UN treaty. Uh, I think there is a hope that coming up to Bali, it won't be, it, it will be addressed to some degree because the Indonesians are going to push very hard on this, and it's an important issue for developing countries. So I do think that we will be see a dialogue on something called the deforestation. I think we will see a, a, an upswing in investment from sustainable, uh, sustainable forestry management companies, um, and I do think that we will begin to see the link between climate change and biological diversity being much more assertively uh, pursued. And I think that there, there are going to be huge opportunities. If you look at the marginal abatement cost curves for um, climate change, for carbon reduction, climate change that were put together by McKinsey uh, a few months ago, you will see that forestry looks like a very, very good proposition. But it will only be forestry if it is linked with the sustainability criterion of the UNFCC uh, that will drive this. In other words, you cannot assume that you can just rip down old growth forests, put plantations in, get a carbon credit, but not worry about the forestry, the, the, uh, the integrity of the ecosystem or the wildlife that live in it. It is going to have to be a combined effort of bringing sustainability in as well as carbon credits. And I think there's going to be a huge opportunity in the forestry sector uh, for that. We're also seeing the emergence of some very, very fine uh, forward-looking forestry companies that are, are really willing to take on board the sustainability criteria. That's a huge opportunity and one that we, we should uh, explore much more rigorously. So what are the third points I would make are what are the sort of financing options ideas? Well, at the international level, at the international public sector level, we've really seen, I would say, three. The first is the Global Environment Facility, uh, which was established as the financing mechanism of the Biodiversity Convention to fund what is the additional or incremental costs. It works through the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Environment Program, and has to date provided about $7.5 billion in grants to about 2,000 projects. About 40% of that, I think, is for biodiversity. Um, and there's a further 3 billion, just over 3 billion pledged between 2006 and 2010. There will be a debate, I think, Bali, which will suggest that that figure is way, way too small. Um, it's provided grants to governments, but it's also provided small grants to over 7,000 NGOs, the bulk of which have been working in locally in biodiversity protection. Um, uh, but I think there are areas where the GF hasn't played a, a, as helpful a role as it might, and that is exactly in looking at how it can twin and accelerate and leverage up private capital. Grants placed strategically in a sort of financial engineering sense really can, en can enhance leverage, financial leverage, tremendously. Whether they, they are used to provide and lengthen the sort of, to become patient capital that Pat talked about, whether it's early, early costs to be covered, where there's risks. Uh, there are many ways in which the GF could play a more innovative role. And I think the, the innovation network that uh, Jim talked about is an area that really could look at how do you use these grants to facilitate and leverage up at a much greater rate. 
Uh, the World Bank and other international financial institutions also work on um, biodiversity. We have to be careful about double counting because what the GF tends to do is say it is leverage of the World Bank, and what the World Bank says is it is leverage the GF. Um, it's often there's a little bit of double counting, but nevertheless, the World Bank has done about 400 projects. With, at about one and a half billion dollars of its own money, plus about a billion from the GEF and two billion in co-financing. So, and it's done work largely in helping establish and gazette protected areas, including buffer zones, eradication of alien species, which is a very important issue, I think, in some of our uh, more rare ecosystems, and improve management schemes. The third area on the international scene that I think has not been exploited enough is if you look at most financiers now, whether they be public, private, international finance, or whatever, they have to conduct a fairly thorough environmental assessment whenever they do investments in infrastructure or whatever. Those environmental assessments have never been used to the full extent, in my judgment, to really look at positive reinforcement and where there may be opportunities to, to, to graft on, as it were, to the work of the infrastructure investments, the kinds of actions and activities that can be positively reinforced. And there's a huge opportunity here. There tends to be a defensive mechanism. Why don't we do no harm? We need to turn environmental assessments into how do we do some good. And I think there's a huge opportunity. And of course, and I won't go into this in detail, you all know the international NGOs and, the, the, that, and those that are national that work overseas now, like the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, WWF, etc. all top-notch uh, uh, conservation NGOs that have done superb work over the years and, and deserve, in fact, in, to see accelerated funding. At the national level, as I spoke earlier, and I won't, I won't belabor this point, Government policies are important, and poor policies can really undermine efforts to conserve. On regulatory reform, better management, ensuring local recurrent costs are met, etc. And finally, at the private sector level, uh, Pat has talked about a lot of these issues. I think there's much more to be gained from ecotourism, and I think this needs to be looked at on long-term leases. I'm involved in a group called the Africa Wildlife Foundation which uh, takes on long-term leases in Africa and then uh, uh, promotes ecotourism in certain areas, but, but very sensitive and sustainable tourism that involves local communities. And I think where we can get good ecotourism with very clear sustainable development guidelines, there's huge opportunity to bring in money and make sure local communities benefit so they feel they have a stake and an ownership in conservation. One area that I also think is worthy of thinking about. And it comes out of the climate change debate where we have something called CERs, which are the Certified Emission Reduction Certificates that, um, that uh, come out of the Climate Change Treaty and the CDM. If you think about it, it is the other thing. Uh, you produce a piece of paper, a certificate, for something you can't see, you can't touch, you can't feel, and yet, and the less you produce of it, the more you make, the more money you make. It's an oddity, but it does suggest that maybe we should be experimenting with ecosystem certificates that are third party uh, reviewed and approved. And maybe we could just get corporations and others to start thinking about how they might offset some of their corporate and social responsibility in terms of purchasing these. We're talking with the UK government at the moment. I work with Globe and I work with a former minister who was the ambassador for forestry for Gordon Brown, a guy called Barry Gardner. And we were talking with him about the possibility of piloting some eco certificates in which these could be utilized by companies as part and parcel of their corporate responsibility, purchased by them. Uh, and we may look to see if they, we could not get tax incentives to do so. I think there's a lot of scope uh, for that. Finally, the sustainable forestry management is an obvious area and how do we incentivate com larger companies? But the timber industry is very much moving in this direction, at least the more, the more responsible timber industry is. And of course, the issues of raising funds, which are needed, uh, I think the use of grants, as I, I would agree with Pat, is a very underutilized instrument that would seem to me needs to be looked at. And finally, I think co-financing with the public sector and looking at how you use challenge grants and grants to financially engineer leverage with the private sector so you offset some of the risks that the private sector would, 
uh, would need to take and maybe uh, a little reluctant to take. Uh, and yet you get a public good benefit and you get a private sector return. And finding equitable benefit sharing, not only between communities and investments, but equitable and benefit sharing between the public sector and the private sector is, I think, a, a, again, an area that is worthy of exploration. So perhaps, Jim, I'll stop there. I, I've spoken perhaps a little more than I intended to. It was it was very interesting, Ian, and you've generated quite a few questions from the audience already. I will start with one from Gregory Ingram, and this is for, for both of you, for Pat and for Ian. Uh, Greg, who is the president of the Lincoln Institute for land, of Land Policy, asked the following. Given the importance of revenue streams, could we hear a bit more about the possibility of enhancing opportunities for getting revenue from trading schemes? Carbon offsets have often been mentioned. What other emerging opportunities are there in this area? Gentlemen. Uh, my, my quick response uh, is, you know, I guess it's because I've been active in it recently, I've been surprised by, and maybe, this, maybe there's some link with Ian's idea on these uh, certificates, but as you move into, uh, you know, Wetlands from wetlands mitigation schemes, which have kind of firmed up to species mitigation, to affluent credits in watersheds, uh, pollution control that you could, you know, um, um, kind of expand all that. Um, I get the sense that there's a lot of work going on, but I haven't seen it uh, personally, and there. Uh, once again, this kind of gets to the networking and coordination. I, I think the, uh, the more we can share ideas, uh, like today's calls, it kind of say, "Oh yeah, I need to look into that." Uh, le let me let me follow up with a second question, unless Ian, uh, you wanted to add to what Pat just said. I mean, first let me say that it's, uh, it must be the great Ingram that I, I know from the World Bank, and uh, he was a former boss of mine, and. Uh, a wonderful boss as well, and, uh, and uh, uh, just to say, I do think there are, there are some things. I think what the, the, the trick we're trying to do, I think, is convert economic values to financial values. That is to say, know that many of these, these have economic value, but they don't enter the marketplace. I think eco-certificates is one. I think thinking about the about being economic benefits, let's say, of watershed protection and finding a mechanism to charge for that water watershed protection and doing it on an annual basis or a monthly basis and, and then having that revenue return is, 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 I think there's a lot more that can be done. And the carbon trading schemes, I don't know because I think there is, a, there is thinking that uh, and there is a tax on carbon trades that will be put into an adaptation fund. That may also be something that could the current, the current cost. The other thing that has been talked a lot, of course, is setting up trust funds where, where you deposit a large sum of money into a trust, and the U.S. NGO movement and foundation movement is used to this, and then you live off the revenue. The great danger you have with that is that at least from donor countries, they've often been um, reluctant to tie up capital. In some cases, legally, they can't do it. But I do think uh, found the foundation model, where you do have a limited revenue that comes in that can pay for the basics of uh, uh, recurrent costs, is another area that should be investigated more, more thoroughly. And there may be some innovation and thinking that needs to be done on this line. The fact that Greg has raised it as a, a, on the revenue side, or at least the recurrent side, I think is very important. There's just too much attention given to capital costs and development costs and first costs, and very little attention given to the, the rather small dibs and drabs, but essential revenue and or recurrent cost support. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me at this point invite the audience. We have about 10 more minutes uh, before we're likely to uh, uh, end this recording. Uh, we aim to go for about an hour. You can ask questions at the bottom of your screen in the question and answer uh, box, and I will try to pick among them to, to uh, relevant topics. I have one here from uh, Carol Williams, who is from Arkansas in the United States. Carol asks, in Arkansas, we're making a great push for biofuels, growth of biomass feedstock and the like. Conservation easements will allow small farmers to reduce 
land costs and encourage the growth of switchgrass uh, and similar products. We're attracting the attention of our legislature to pass a transferable state tax credits for easements. Have you seen such local government participation to be effective? Um, I, I can begin by saying that I know that in uh, the states of Virginia and Colorado, there are presently transferable tax uh, credits for conservation easements and that we have very lively markets in, in both states uh, and they're coming to the attention of the legislatures uh, repeatedly. They're refining those programs. I think the programs are probably getting better over time. Uh, and I, again, can refer you to a chapter in Walden to Wall Street uh, written by Phil Hawker about his experience in Virginia uh, with such programs. Pat or Ian, would you, would you like yeah, to add? Yeah, Tim, I might just jump in. Uh, the interesting thing is, since our land trust operates in Virginia, uh, the tax credit program was basically a Republican program because they liked uh, – they very much like the idea that it was generated by the landowner on his own initiative for his own benefit and not a, a government forced program. So it's always had strong government support. And the good news, bad news is that it, it's been so successful that the legislatures had to put a cap on it, uh, which we're kind of uh, struggling with. So. Um, you know, it's proven out to be a very valuable mechanism in our land trust easement program. Uh, I mean, we know talking to landowners that it's it's made it a, a big incremental difference. I, I think it demonstrates that if you open up markets uh, to trade in uh, such benefits, that they very quickly organize themselves to take advantage of those benefits. Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know the specifics of the case, so I can't really comment, but more generally, I think, um, it's what I said earlier about it being both a public good and a private good, and I think what we've got to make sure is that when tax breaks are thought about and given in the way that you've just spoken about, Jim, they're not seen as some sort of subsidy or handout. They're really a public payment for the public good element uh, of, of, the, of the deal, as it were. Uh, with the private sector playing the role it needs to play. And I think a little bit more work sometimes needs to be done to try and value the public good dimension of both local and, I would say, international sort of biodiversity con conservation. I think that's an area that is, is well worth doing once you can pro prove that it's not about a subsidy or a handout, but it's a payment, actually, for the public good part of the story. Very good. Very good. I have a question from... Uh, a, a Pesci, I don't have a location for this person, but a uh, very good question, which is, without being a for-profit organization, how do we entice financiers to be interested in funding our projects? Pat? Um, well, I think, I think the essence of the answer is that the, um, the project needs to, I don't know how to say it, the project needs to fund itself um, for private capital to work. So, I don't know, we're working on a um, a big project in, in, in Virginia, and the, once again, the ultimate home will probably be a public agency down the road. <clears throat> but the land itself is valuable, so once once you close on the deal, you have collateral in hand, and then you need to, I think, part of the trick at the moment, and this I think broadly relates to Ian's comments on public-private partnerships, you need to put together a finance plan that gets you from closing down to whatever permanent ownership it is. And, um, you know, there's um, one of the participants in the in the workshop is – is one of an emerging group of, of entities, and this one is, is now called Ecosystem Partners. But they they recently closed on a piece of land in in down there in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. But they can they can restore the wetlands and get credits. They can um, get carbon credits. They get species credits. Um, a part of the land can be sold to joint national park. So. Um, once you understand the economic value, then there's, 
once again, Ian says, you need to figure out how to turn that into financial value. And, but if there are trading mechanisms and there are there is collateral and there, there are willing people willing to pay for credits, uh, you can actually earn a handsome return on the exercise. And the, the, the not-for-profit nature is kind of irrelevant. You're the you're the catalyst, the instigator. <laughs> you don't have to be. You don't have to. You don't have to have a balance sheet of your own to get the job done. You just have to know how. In the same way, invested bankers, you know, can do initial public offerings. They know where the, you know, they take the company and they know the investors. So you just have to know how to package your project. Let me let me add to that that there are increasing numbers of projects that go into the uh, category of limited development projects or conservation limited development projects, where nonprofits such as land trusts. Uh, and local conservancies are teaming up with private sector interests to get very ambitious projects done. Uh, one is um, in New York State along the Hudson River, Scenic Hudson, uh, and its Beacon Long Dock project uh, is a wonderful example of that, and you can learn more about that by going to Scenic Hudson's website. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has done a terrific project in partnership with Coastal Enterprises, Inc. in Maine. Uh, at several places, one that comes to mind is the Katahdin Ironworks, where the conservation community and the private sector got together to save a working forest and preserve biodiversity and uh, social values. So there, there are a number of these kind of projects, uh, and uh, we will, with the Conservation Finance Innovation Network, uh, try over coming months to highlight some of them. I have one more question uh, from a colleague who works at the Nature Conservancy in Santiago, Chile, named Victoria Alonso. She has a great question, which I think will uh, sum up the discussion for this morning. How can all these good ideas reach developing countries such as Chile, where there are no strong NGOs, the private sector does not sense the importance of conservation, and government uh, are made weak I'm sorry. The private sector does not sense the importance of conservation, uh, and government has uh, includes some weak institutions. So basically, how do we transfer what appears to be happening uh, fairly quickly in North America to other markets around the world that have uh, growing private sectors, that have uh, NGOs that are very anxious to get these kind of deals done, but lack the experience in doing so? Well, Jim and Ian will remember a discussion we had in Ian's office some years ago, um, or maybe, but where we tried to figure out a way to get kind of a scholarship program so that conservationists from countries around the world, including Chile, could come to places like the Land Trust Alliance Rally. And in fact, the Land Trust, uh, until recently, there was always a strong, I remember meeting actually from uh, groups from Argentina, Chile, and the Czech Republic, and uh, from uh, the Asian Pacific re region. And frankly, I think it because of the difference. You know, some of the differences that were pointed out in in uh, land ownership and regulatory frameworks and everything, and the unique uniqueness of our tax system. One, I thought, <laughs> I think it was found not to be economic for the Land Trust Alliance to sponsor this and and there weren't enough courses for it. But I, I think that the transfer of knowledge to take models and, and, and I think there are models that exist in emerging markets that can be brought brought to the US. So I think that transfer needs to needs to take place. And the Land Trust Alliance, I don't know, with the, they just celebrated their twenty fifth anniversary. So, you know, some people sat down it's like your question. Somebody sat down twenty five years ago and said, you know, we need to do something. And 25 years later, it's flourishing. So, uh, you know, just get started. Ian, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's been well enough, but I think it's a very important and very good question. Um, I think, I think we, you know, when I look at what happened in this country, the climate change debate, it was really serious information and awareness. Um, a guy called Nick Stern, uh, who, who Produced a report for the British government. He's a colleague of mine, actually here, and um, and that had an enormous has had an enormous impact. 
And so I think uh, kind of information awareness, quality, quality work that, that says to a government and the people of a country, you have this unbelievable asset, and Chile has an incredible asset. Uh, that can be a very valuable asset. It's not a liability, the land that's not used. It's a tremendous asset. So the first, I think, is information and awareness. And then the second is trying to look at who are the key stakeholders. I, I'm sure that in Chile, as in every country that I've worked in, there are stakeholders who do care deeply. There are champions. How to find those champions and work with them. The third, I would say, is the private sector is increasingly under scrutiny and therefore is becoming a very important player, irrespective of where they are, in wanting to show that they are part and parcel of the future solution to our planet and not part of the problem. I think, again, working with enlightened private sector. And then perhaps both on training, exposure, looking at models, looking at what we're willingness to take risks in models. And if they don't work, that's okay. Try, we can try something else. There's a lot out there that I think the network that you've got, Jim, and that Pat has talked about can, can be very valuable for, for this kind of uh, uh, efforts in, in all countries, whether it's in Chile or, or elsewhere. Well, let, let me use that opportunity to plug uh, a conference that's coming up a year from this January. That is in uh, January of 2009. Um, we are planning to hold a conference on conservation finance as it can be transferred from North America to other parts of the world. It's going to be in Valdivia, Chile. Uh, because you're all part of this network, you will be hearing more about it in months to come. But it's exactly that kind of transfer of ideas and mechanisms uh, that we think can uh, allow ideas that are just beginning uh, to gain scale in the developed world to begin to, begin to gain scale in the developing world. Now, uh, it's time for me to, to to close the session, I want to close it by inviting you to um, submit more questions. We have a at the back of the Conservation Finance Innovation Network website, we have a page uh, that I'm trying to go to right now, but uh, not succeeding. Let's see if I get this. Called Ask the Experts. And uh, basically, this is an audience that's been paying attention to uh, great questions and wonderful answers and, and thoughts over the last hours. Uh, last hour, uh, I imagine that you might have some thoughtful questions that come into your head right now, or perhaps uh, after you sleep on all of the content that we've heard today. Uh, I invite you to send your questions to ask the experts at cfinetwork.org, and uh, if we get two or three that are particularly uh, interesting and insightful questions. We'll pose those to the panelists today and several others and see if we can't publish those for the community so that we keep uh, this dialogue going and vibrant. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, we will strive to come back to you in the next quarter or quarters, uh, and I hope that this is the start of something that we, uh, we can build on. Thank you so much, and uh, have a good day. Well, thank you very much, and goodbye. Yeah, thanks. It's terrific.